to today's panel discussion um, focused on really providing a behind the scenes view into the development of the next gen drone, which is Skydio X10, which is uh, designed and built here inside the US. So I'm Jason Tillman, as, as what was alluded earlier, product marketing director over here at Skydio and very excited to be joined by several members of our X10 development team. So today we'll be sharing some experiences and learnings of our panelists along the way from the conceptualization of the X10 all the way through the release. So kind of provide that behind the scenes view for you. And as you notice, one of our panelists, Kevin Clemens, was unfortunately unable to attend today, uh, but we had plenty of, uh, of uh, conversation with our existing panelists. Um, so we were not going to be lacking say, content or topics today. And so before I hand the microphone to each one of our panelists for introductions, I want to provide a very quick overview of the X10 just to set the stage for today's discussion. And so September 2023, we announced the X10 at our first annual events called Skydio Attend, um, with shipments starting later last year, around November. And a few months later, we released a highly secure version called the X10 for defense use cases. And there were three areas we primarily wanted to focus on. X10, which aligned to the needs that we heard for the market. Number one was camera improvements. Number two was maximizing the capabilities of AI. Number three was resiliency and adaptability. And so first we want to focus on um, one of the most important factors and that's the ability to capture aerial data. And so with this, we introduced um, sensor packages, which are really collections of market leading cameras and senses, sensors for tackling the most common use cases and really allows the X10 to punch well above its weight class. And these include narrow, wide, telephoto, and radiometric thermal options. The next, Skydio has been known for years for having some of the smartest drones inside the sky powered by autonomy. And we took this to really a new level with the X10 and really introduced 10 times that compute power on board. And that unlocks all sorts of things, such as uh, the ability to build 3D maps on the drone in the field without connection to a computer or autonomously navigate even in complete darkness. And then finally, drones are expected to be resilient inside some of the harshest conditions. So we not only made the X10 uh, capable of thriving in all types of weather um, with the IP55 rating, but we also made it highly adaptable with attachments that can extend the drone's usefulness no matter what the mission range requires. So we also doubled down on connectivity, which enabled longer distance connections. And with 5G LTE connectivity, operators can really fly anywhere they want. So if, uh, the mission's taking place in Los Angeles and the operators over in New York they can absolutely do that. And so again, allows a level of flexibility there. And so with that, it's time to introduce our panelists and I'll hand it off to them for some quick introductions before we move on to the questions here. And so I'll go ahead and start. And Harrison, do you wanna introduce yourself? Yeah, hey, uh, I'm Harrison. Uh, I'm an autonomy engineer here at Scadio. Been here for around five years at this point. And uh, I was the autonomy lead for the X10 program. And then uh, Russell. Yeah, hi everyone. My name is Russell Bondi. Uh, I'm a senior manager on the image quality team. Um, uh, really excited to be here today, and I, I led the the effort in in putting out high quality imagery and videos for the the X10 program. And then finally, uh, Asher. Hello, everyone. I'm Asher. I'm uh, the mechanical lead for R47, and I started Skydio after graduating school in 2016. So been here a minute. All right, well, excellent. So I'll just turn off the uh, screen share here so we can see all the panelists. And so on here, we'll go ahead and get started here with the first question. Um, and this is really focused towards Russell. Um, so can you share some insights into the camera selection process for the X10? So specifically, what kind of cameras were chosen and why? And then additionally, if there's any valuable learnings you gained along the way, and most importantly, how do those camera choices align with those common usage cases that the drone actually will experience? Yeah, um, it's a it's a great question, you know. And and to to paint the the picture of the X10 camera journey, I'll, I'm going to kind of start here at the beginning. And and a lot of it was was driven by uh, having a really great relationship with some of our customers. Um, the S2 when we started the X10 journey was out in the wild. People were using it. Our customers were were loving it. And um, and and you know they were really kind of customers and partners with us. And they they allowed us to come out and understand the use cases. So we had kind of, you know, different key customers in the, the different sectors and use cases that we were, we were targeting. Um, and they were, you know, champions for us. And they really were like, Hey, you know, this is a great product here are kind of the things we love about it. Here are the areas we, we want to improve on. Um, and they, they gave us opportunities to come out and visit with them, which my team really jumped on. We went out to many different customer sites and, 
and watched their their kind of workflow and tried to understand exactly what kind of data they're they're trying to gather and and what was the the pain points and how you know how they did it and and you know what were the challenges and I remember one experience I went on I, I went to a utility company and they actually set me up with a, with a hard hat and a, and a set of headphones and a microphone. And I was like plugged into this whole system. And I was able to kind of watch the operators go through the workflow of these different shot lists they had and, and ask questions over the, the microphone being like, what, what exactly are you looking at here? And they'd be like, oh, this shot is, is geared towards trying to understand like the rot on the pole, or we're looking for the, the neutral line in this one. And, and so, you know, I think that was a big part of helping us choose hardware and and drive our decisions was understanding what what our customers really wanted to do what data they were they were truly after um and so using that it was also difficult because uh customers had a lot of different requirements across different use cases and so our approach was you know what's the the hardest requirement or what's the smallest kind of object that that the utility space needs to to be able to capture um, so we kind of aimed at that. We'd be like, hey, utility space, they need to be able to, you know, read this tiny text on this plate. And we assumed if if we can read the tiny text on that plate, we can probably do all of their, you know, requirements or pass all their requirements. And same thing for the situational awareness use cases. Like, hey, what's the hardest thing you guys are trying to do? And we'll tackle that one and, and kind of make this assumption that we're going to um, be successful with the other requirements. And so understanding the, you know, what data was needed allowed us to then go back and choose sensors. We then, you know, worked with Sony and we'd be like, Hey, you know, quickly know that, that we need a certain resolution in order to accomplish these, this, this data capture. And then, you know, once we had our lens sensors narrowed down, we moved on to, to lens vendors and we worked with them. We'd be like, Hey, you know, what's off the shelf here? What, what can we find? And, and, you know, we also understood that this is kind of a, a new use case, especially trying to accomplish so much um, with, with the single drone that's in this kind of weight class. Uh, we wanted to keep everything small and light. Um, and so we can't explode our cameras because then that balloons the drone that's behind it. Uh, so we we worked with lens vendors and it turned out like no one had really made these lenses yet. So we we worked with them. We designed custom lenses uh, really specific for the use cases. And we worked with them constantly, a huge amount of back and forth to dial in this lens and make sure, you know, we had, you know, a good amount of sharpness in the center and the corners and that we weren't, you know, contributing a huge amount of flair. And there's all these aspects to designing a lens to match the sensor and create a really like harmonious camera system that, that works well. So we worked with vendors and we, we dialed in this process. And then, you know, during during the whole thing, we continued to visit our customers. And, and really, as we, we dialed in our hardware, we got comfortable with that. Uh, we had a, a great sensor, a great lens, an actuator that was able to drive it for autofocus. Um, then we stepped up our game into our tuning and and that was again where our customers really helped us and we would go out and be like with a, with a prototype image their you know whatever the data set they wanted to capture review the images with them be like you know where can we improve here and they you know some examples that come to mind from from the R or from the X10 uh, program are uh, are we went out to a customer and, and there was just a lot of uh, at the current phase this was like early in the development we were doing you know denoise which is like pretty standard in a, in a camera system. There, there's noise that's being produced from the sensor and, and, and you try to remove some of that. And we were out with a vendor and they were like, look, you know, you guys are doing denoise and we, we can see that it's a, it's a pretty noticeable um, effect. And they're like, you know, we don't really care about noise. Like, you know, as long as it, it's like there, it's not like a, it's not a consumer product. We don't care about noise. You don't have to remove it because what happens sometimes when you remove noise is, you actually remove some of the information that's there as well. Like maybe there's text on a plate and the algorithm misidentifies some of the text as noise and, and smooths it out. And so from that like learning process, we were like, oh, we, we can turn our noise reduction way down. Customers aren't really like super focused on noise. They're more focused on collecting data and, and getting good data. And, and so we, we, we tile things in, we, we reduce noise reduction, we let more noise through, but in the end of the day, we had a huge amount of information and the data was always there was, we were preserving this data for our customers. Um, and, and, you know, I think that was super valuable for us. I think in the end product, it's really valuable for our customers because they're getting what they want. Like they want information, they want to see cracks, they want to read small text. Um, and so we, we did this continued iteration with our customers and it, it was really fantastic process for us. Um, we ran into to other things where we wanted to add extra layers of algorithms, like our autofocus algorithm um, was tricky to, to work with. And, and we worked with our customers and found out that like they want to prioritize foreground a lot more. So we added a layer there 
that allows us to have multiple windows in a center window and really focus on exactly what we want. You know, it's tricky to, to look at a scene and, 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 you know, your eye can be like, I want to focus on that. And then you would normally touch, but we wanted to take that touch interface out. We didn't want our customers to have to touch the screen every time we wanted our auto autofocus algorithm to be smart enough to like understand the scene, detect exactly what they want and focus for them. Um, and so those types of challenges were super tricky and, and, you know, luckily we, we, we caught them early in our process and figured it out. And again, that's a lot of like feedback and, and going out and testing. And we, we really put the, the X10 program through its paces, a lot of different cameras. We wanted to test them in a lot of different environments, um, all the use cases across the board. And so we, we spent a lot of time out in the field, a lot of time with, with customers and partners, um, dialing in the process, understanding, you know, the limitations and, and trying to make it, um, as good of a ca data capture platform as we could. Um, and I'm, I'm really excited how it turned out. I, I think people are happy with it and I'm excited to, to continue working on the, the X10 program, you know, moving forward, coming out with new releases, new algorithms, um, to, to boost the camera performance. Um, and I think that, that kind of summarizes the journey. You know, we started with understanding what needed to be done. We moved into this really fantastic hardware phase of lens design, sensor selection, you know, choosing the best of the best for, for this high quality while keeping everything nice and tight and compact. And then went into the tuning side where, where I think Skydio really strives. We, we listen to the feedback from customers. Um, we take a, spend a lot of time doing fine tuning. Um, you know, that, that noise I mentioned, noise to, to detail ratio is something that takes a, a long process to get it really dialed in um, and a lot of other aspects as well. So I'm, I'm super happy with where we are on the X10 camera systems. And uh, it was a really fun project. I hope that uh, that answers your question, Jason. <laughs> Yeah, and absolutely. Um, and could you give us a reminder in terms of what the the sensors and uh, camera um, look like on the X10 and how we organize those in the sensor packages? Yeah, so we um, we designed everything so that would we be you know a, as high quality performance through a, a, the zoom range as possible. So we we paired our our forty degree this is horizontal field of view um, sixty four megapixel narrow camera we call it the narrow with our tele camera so. You, you can gain the situational awareness, the kind of overarching view with your 40 degree. And then you, you zoom over to your telly, which is a 48 megapixel, 10 horizontal degree um, field of view. And you can really punch in with that one. So we, that's kind of the workhorse for the situational awareness. It's also super powerful in, in the utilities industry. When, when the standoff distance is required, you need, you know, let's say 10 meters. So you can keep a safe distance from something that's like highly powered and still punch in and get that you know, the, the ID or the serial number off a part that needs to be replaced. So we like that combination for, for being able to zoom in and also gain situational awareness. And then the, for the 300 L we, we paired that with a one inch, um, Sony sensor, uh, with an 80 degree horizontal field of view. And we paired that with a narrow camera, the same camera that's in the, the Z is also in there that allows you to have a little of that punch in range, but also kill a much wider field of view for efficiency with mapping and, and 3d scan and other products like that. So it's a uh, it's 50 megapixels there with a nice big pixel on that, um, a great lens in front of it, and uh, and then all those are paired with a radiometric thermal as well. Excellent. Well, thanks very much. And uh, you know you can always have like the greatest uh, cameras inside the world, but if the drone makes it very challenging to actually fly and actually get this stuff done, it makes the the process of actually doing these missions oh so much more challenging. So this next question is. For really for Harrison. Um, and so Skydio really has a history of really producing some of the smartest drones inside the sky. What the Skydio autonomy is really being core to everything that we do. So would you mind uh, delving into the role of artificial intelligence, AI, into setting the X10 apart? And really how does AI really enhance the, its capabilities or if there's any surprise use cases that emerge during testing? Would love to hear your perspective on that. Yeah, I mean, I think like first and foremost, when it comes to like integrating autonomy um, into the drone, Skydio has a pretty unique approach. Like it's something that we designed from day one, you know, when we're whiteboarding out the, when we were whiteboarding out the concept for X10, um, you know, this wasn't some feature we added at the last minute, you know, from, from day one, when we're like at the concept stage, we're trying to figure out, hey, how can we incorporate as much like autonomy as possible to the system? How can we make this the best like autonomous flying robot? Um, and then the other thing for X10 when we were designing it is um, we not only want it to be super awesome at release, but to a certain extent, we want it to be a platform we can iterate on, develop on. So like as advances in algorithms come, we can update the platform and make sure it's always at the bleeding edge. Um, yeah, in terms of 
I guess the the design process, like the the biggest thing for us is you know the design goal from the hardware perspective, which is the platform that all these algorithms build on top of, um, was kind of having as much compute as possible and something that can fly. We kind of wanted to make a flying supercomputer. Um, so in that regards, you know, one of the huge things that really enables like our capability here is the fact that we shipped with a, a NVIDIA Orin processor. Um, the Orin kind of in the form factor that we have it on is NVIDIA's latest and greatest, you know, AI compute chip. Um, that was actually kind of an interesting story. It wasn't even out when we started the X10 program. We kind of made a late decision to upgrade the chip that we were shipping with halfway through. Um, and, you know, even though that carried a lot of extra EE work and a lot of like software work to integrate that, we thought it was super important to have, you know, the, the latest and greatest hardware because it would really, it's really like the workhorse that enables all the cool AI work that we're doing on top. Um, and then in terms of the kind of algorithmic side, we kind of think of the autonomy system in two different layers. Um, so the kind of base layer is like our core navigation engine, which is what uh, allows us to do like obstacle avoidance, what, you know, the control system and kind of the visual navigation system that allows us to fly with that GPS. And I think the benefits of that were the super known quantity from S2 and from our experience with S2 and X2, like this is kind of the core system that lets the drone fly itself um, and really reduce, you know, the amount of operator uh, like load. And then I think the other thing is that um, the autonomy system is also what allows us to fly in really challenging environments like, you know, GPS and I environments that other systems just can't fly in. Um, and our goal kind of with X10 was, you know, let's take everything with S2 and X2 um, and that we can already do and make it better. So um, basically in every category that customer, like in our core flight uh, system, we wanted to upgrade it. So this really is like a next generation leap and, you know, obstacle avoidance and controls and, and navigation. And then I think the other huge thing that maybe people don't realize is like an AI capability is, you know, the expansion of what we wanted uh, X10 to be able to do. So for example, supporting uh, payloads, um, I think that's actually maybe one of the great examples of like in some other systems, when you put on a payload, you don't have obstacle avoidance, but aircraft can be more challenging to fly, you know, you don't get OA, so it's super easy to damage the aircraft. So, you know, a huge focus for us for X10 was like, we knew kind of already the amount of benefits of, of the autonomy system. So making sure that integrated well with payloads so you, know, you can modularly plug stuff in, uh, plug in attachments and still have, you know, that obstacle avoidance, still have that robust control. Um, and yeah, like also kind of recognizing that, you know, OA is super useful on S2 and X2, unfortunately, that's kind of limited to the daytime. You know, we're a vision-based system at, at the end of the day. And obviously if you have low light, that can be very challenging. So kind of not just working with the hardware team to develop the night sense hardware, but also kind of tuning our algorithms to work really robustly in that environment was a huge focus. Um, but that all is kind of the navigation engine layer. That's kind of, you know, the AI pilot. And, but the, the real thing that we also focused on the autonomy team is also how do we have you know the the X10 help you with your mission, um, and in what kind of applications can we build on top of that pilot a stack that we've already built? You know, basically, very few people are flying just because they want to fly for the sake of flying. You know, people have a mission that they're trying to accomplish, whether it's to inspect an asset, whether it's to provide situational awareness. Um, so on the autonomy side, yeah, we definitely for all those cases try to you know, leverage AI to make that as easy as possible, you know, for situational awareness, for example, developing, you know, super long range um, subject tracking to take advantage of that sweet zoom capability that's provided by the sensor package. Um, and on the inspection side, having uh, systems in play like 3D scan that allow you to automate data capture, automate data twinning, um, and, you know, really ultimately have X10 be uh, a partner um, with folks that are trying to get stuff done. Well, excellent. Well, thanks very much, uh, Harrison. Uh, yeah, I know that AI is, uh, you know, the buzzword du jour going out there right now. And so, um, you know, I know when we first uh, came out with our initial Skydio drones, it was very, very new. AI was still very new out there. So it's exciting to see what this is actually taking us. Um, but, you know, you can have the best cameras and sensors on a drone. You can have it so it's, it's amazing with autonomy. But if it can't really handle what's actually the environment that's being thrown into it, or can't just really adapt 
makes things very, very kind of challenging. So um, Asher, you know, the physical design of the drone actually matter, matters immensely here. And so how did the team approach designing the actual airframe of the X-10? So like what kind of considerations um, went into insurance adaptability uh, for whatever mission happens to go out there? And then were there any trade-offs, unique challenges that you kind of ran into along this process? Yeah, good question. So short answer is like, it was extremely challenging because we designed one drone that's going to meet the needs of many customers. And many of the requirements are the same. Everyone wants their drone to fly longer, be more robust. But like the relative importance of each one can change a bit for each customer. Um, so as Russell said, what we do, it's like very highly valued at Skydio, is working with customers and learning, you know, what do they care about? Um, so we encourage customer visits by everyone, not just solutions engineers who will work with particular customers with their with their trade-offs. You'll we will go out and like sit there and listen. And you find yourself asking these questions that just would never come up in an engineering lab. Um, in the last visit I had, I, would, I learned a ton about how like this one particular customer was using our dual charger, throwing in the back of a car and putting a rock on it. And that was how they would charge our batteries between two between two um, sites. I was like, I had no idea this is, what, this is exactly what was going on. Um, so really, it really makes you think. Um, so to your question, how do we make the, the drone adaptable? Um, when you start designing like this, you get the customer insight, and then, then what you start is just a blank screen with all of your sensors and electronics. This is what Harrison was talking about. This is this is the, the, the early work in figuring out exactly what to make, and it's totally linked between autonomy and hardware and sensing of the cameras. Um, and what we do is we move everything around in the space and come up with different architectures. What's the balance, what's the, what are the benefits of each one? Like, uh, should we put the cir these, these circuit boards over here? Should we make them one big circuit board, two little ones? How big are the, is the sensor package? As Russell was talking about, like which combinations of sensors would you, would you install? Depending on exactly that geometry, how big does the drone end up getting? And eventually we start narrowing in on some after a bunch of prototyping and, and a bunch of, oh man, this really isn't working. Um, so eventually we start narrowing down on, on, on an approach. And that kind of comes down to two things. One of them is figuring out which capabilities um, we should turn into attachments. Uh, the, the slide you had opened. The second go is highlighting all the attachments we've had. Those are capabilities that would work really well for one customer, but we don't want to like stick like maybe the night autonomy package for every customer. That's heavy, and certain customers are always just going to be operating during the day. Um, so our design approach is one, pull off all these unique sensor, these unique capabilities. And the second one is what's on the core drone? It's just this balance, this continuous trade-off of sensing, flight time, how big it is, the size, um, and the general robustness. Um, and we want to just nail those core capabilities and the, the balance between them. So the sensing, as, as, as Russell was talking about, is the size of the user cameras, which combinations, but also how big is the, the GPS antenna? How accurate and reliable do we need the GPS to be? Everyone mm -hmm. wants that to be really good, but you know, you're not gonna make your GPS huge. Um, same for Wi-Fi antennas, range is it's critically important, but we can't just put like your, your home, home Wi-Fi antennas onto the drone. So there's a, there's a, there's a size balance there. And then our core chips, we went top of the line NVIDIA processor with the Orin, but we also need to set thermal limits. So I can make a heat sink that's super big and now I can I can run this, you know, on, on the, probably not on the sun, couldn't get that good, but I can run it really hot. And I want to trade off the thermal limits with you know, the size of the drone. So you're balancing the sensors we put in there with the size. Certain customers, they're gonna pull the drone out of their trunk. They don't really care about the size. Others want to have it in a backpack folded up so every bit, every tr little trade-off we make will slowly grow the drone. Uh, like a good example of that was, was I keep mentioning the, the, the camera packages. We we're working over and over on this with, with Russell. We've, we went through like a dozen different variations of which cameras we want. I think at the end, we've really nailed it. But each one, you're like, okay, we want two cameras next to each other. And like the gap between the cameras will define the size of the drone overall. And if you add more cameras, then the gimbal gets heavier. You kind of need more sway clearance to have good footage. And then that keeps making the drone um, bigger and bigger. Um, so I've mentioned like sensing the size and you know, packing everything in really dense. Um, and the last big variable is flight time. 
It just comes down to every step of the way, where can we take out mass? Uh, and it's it, sometimes it gets ridiculous, but each bit, we you know, like this is going to be a customer using this drone for thousands of hours. You know, every every additional headroom on flight time, uh, you know, that matters. Um, and now, the last thing is always robustness. So the drone is, a, is an enterprise drone. This is like built ground up for these enterprise use cases, which means it's, we need it to work, whether it's in, you know, the back of, of a car for public safety, if someone's driving around all day for inspecting energy utilities or within the defense space, you need it to work every time. And just cause you, you know, drop it a little bit or, or handle it roughly, that's what your job is and it needs to work. So the whole, the, our whole entire design process is balancing, balancing these variables and moving around until we finally converged on what the X10 looks like now, which I think it's gorgeous. Absolutely. Well, thanks for that perspective there, Asher. Um, and, you know, uh, it gets brought up, you know, we, we talked about some of the prior drones that we've actually had here. So this is a question for Harrison. Is it a pro you know, when we look at some of the functionality that was in prior drones, like let's say the X2, for example, let's say autonomy in the X2, it could be pretty much anything else in there. Is it simply a process of actually just moving that over to the new drone, like the X10? Is it that simple or is it a little bit more complicated than that? Yeah, that's a good question. Um... Yeah, I feel like to a certain extent, we get asked this internally a lot, like, hey, you made S2 and X2 fly great, shouldn't you just have to port some code and make it work? Um, I think I think the real answer is, is that, yeah, it's actually surprisingly a lot of work, um, or not so surprising when you think about it, like our, our autonomy stack is really tightly coupled um, and really kind of designed to max out the performance of our hardware platform. Um, and X10 really does kind of represent a huge kind of hardware architecture shift from S2 and X2. So I think, you know, there was a lot of areas going into the program where, quite frankly, like we were kind of nervous whether or not we'd be able to even meet S2 and X2 performance um, because kind of at a high level, S2 and X2 um, made a lot of design trade-offs to make the autonomy problem easier. Um, and for X10, we really wanted to not just have best-in-class autonomy, but like a best-in-class aircraft. Um, like as a specific example with our NAVCAM geometry, uh, those of you that are familiar with S2 and the X2 will note that like the NAVCAMs are spaced very far apart. They're on the, uh, basically um, at, on the end of the arms by the propellers. Um, from a robotics perspective, this is great because this creates like what's called like a lot of baseline and algorithmically you want as much baseline as possible to have good uh, OA performance for X10. Um, but, you know, moving the cameras out there has a lot of, mechanical design trade-offs. You know, you have to make your arm super stiff. There's a huge mass and flight time penalty associated with that. It's a lot less robust um, to have the cameras kind of just out there. It makes them a lot more susceptible to, to damage. So for X10, we wanted to move it um, back on to the, the vehicle body, but that presented a huge host of kind of autonomy problems in the sense that, hey, like your autonomy algorithm has to be basically four or five times better just to match the performance of S2 and X2 um, because of that reduced baseline. And oh, hey, by the way, on top of that, we're not just trying to match performance, we're trying to make it a lot better. So um, yeah, I think that's an example of, yeah, we had to spend a lot of effort and you know, thankfully we were able to figure that out, um, you know, make a lot of algorithmic and processing improvements and ultimately get better performance. But I think that kind of goes to show like how kind of tightly coupled um, some of the things that seem like, oh, it should be easy to port actually are to like new hardware. Um, and, then, and then Russell, from a camera perspective, have there been any more advanced functionality um, that we've enabled that really unlocks additional depth inside some of the use cases? Um, yeah, I mean, I think just kind of, you know, piggybacking on, on what Harrison was talking about, like designing a next gen navigation camera that again, like the, he talked about the reduced baseline, you know, when you reduce the baseline, there's, you have to improve your camera systems. Um, and so we had to take that and, and really, you know, the unique piece of the nav camera is that a standard camera, you always want the sharpest part to be in the center of the image. And that's kind of how everything was designed um, going, you know, forward for all our generations before. And so when we looked at the, the X10 navigation camera, we had this reduced baseline we needed to add a new layer to our lenses. So we designed a really specific navigation lens to have super high performance quality at the very periphery of the lens because our lenses are, are are kind of positioned like this on the drone right like the the center of the lens is looking at the sky and the ground which really isn't 
the key, right? We want to be looking forward towards trees and branches and poles and whatnot. So you're always looking at the, the real extreme part of the lens, which especially on a really wide angle lens can be degraded. So we designed our lens specifically to have a super high um, pixel density along that edge there to give us better um, image quality, more information, more data to help kind of mitigate that reduced baseline. And that's just for the for the nav camera. That was a, a cool functionality that we added in. Um, and then for the user cameras, the sensors we selected were super versatile sensors, right? Like we had a, a, a ZZ HDR on the S2 and X2 program that, that was great, but it came with a lot of downside. Um, and then we moved over to a quad bear HDR, which is a, a different type of sensor. It allows you to have um, multiple exposures per single pixel. Um, and so you can get this really high quality, wide dynamic range with uh, a really great image quality. Still, you're not taking a huge amount of loss there because the ZZ HDR, there was some, some loss in that. Um, whereas the quad bear is, a, is just a better algorithm and, and a really cool way to stretch the dynamic range a huge amount without losing much. Um, we also moved up to the sensors that are a much higher megapixels, right? Like 64, 50, and 48. Like that's a lot of megapixels to be cramming into such a small package. And then pairing that down with, with a bend mode and a low light mode that I think we call it quarter low light is super powerful. So if, if you're in broad daylight, this camera, you fire it up, you can take these super high resolution images. And then let's say you're doing a bridge inspection or you're flying, you know, post sunset, we have this low light mode, which allows us to, to make the pixels bigger, stretch the exposure times and do some functionality there. So I think the the coolest kind of advancements there are just the the functionality of these sensors, the versatility of them. Um, is, is It was a really powerful and exciting part. And again, we, we're pairing that with with a bunch of um, fancy components like lenses and sensors makes us, you know, pretty powerful uh, camera packages. And, you know, uh, Russell, just I'd be amiss if I didn't mention that the uh, the recent uh, testing that we've done with Imatest to actually showcase those because, you know, that's that's been one of the ones that, you know, we've actually heard quite frankly in the past is, you know, your guys' um, cameras, you know, they're, they're good, but we really want more. We would demand more from that. And so, um, I don't know if you want to go a little bit into that in test uh, testing um, and just kind of provide a little perspective on that. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, uh, you know, we worked with customers a lot to get their feedback, but another way we kind of approach solving and making sure that our data was was high enough quality was was understanding what they were using today that was getting the job done. So we'd ask them like, hey, what what vehicle is flying out there today that's getting you the data that you need? We then go out and buy that vehicle. We then benchmark against that vehicle, being like, okay, the X10 cameras are you know our kind of goal was to to find the industry standard in all the places and then make sure that we exceeded it. So we'd go out, we'd buy the the, the drone. So that was kind of our in, internal process, right? Using these charts in the background and you can see behind me, um, we measured like the competition. We made sure that we were sharper and better. And then we turned it around and went out inside and subjectively. And then we, you know, we partnered with Imatest, who, who's a fantastic, um, you know, camera company, camera like assessment company. They, they build a lot of charts and, and then software to, to analyze and understand like the camera performance. Um, and we sent them, you know, the, the, the products that we had heard from customers were like best in class. And we also sent our, our X10 and they were able to measure, you know, the key aspects of a camera system. They measured the sharpness, which I talked about and sharpness comes down to, to noise performance and how good your system is. Cause they were, they were measuring JPEGs, um, the color accuracy, dynamic range, and then noise performance. And, you know, we, we thought that that data that came back from them was fantastic. It showed X10 really kind of, uh, you know, a good, a good amount ahead of the competition. Um, and then, you know, the part that to me that made the most sense is that we weren't like defying physics. Like there was areas in that report that made it very valid. Like if you have a much larger pixel in a really low light scene, it's going to accept more light. You should see the data kind of swip swap, you know, and things should, should come short. So like full res should do worse. And it all kind of matched our expectations. Um, so it allowed Skydio to show that we're really a high class camera that's like, you know, exceeding uh, the competition, but also wasn't just like, you know, making Skydio seem like this absolutely ridiculous system. Like, I think it was very level and, and a very honest report, which I, you know, uh, encourage people to go out and, you know, maybe not read the, you know, the whole report because it's a little bit dense, but at least check out the, the blog post and, and read through that. I think it's a pretty good summary there, so. Absolutely. Um and then um, th this actually relates to one of the questions we actually had submitted here. Um, and this is a question for you, Asher, is, you know, many of you may be aware that we design and manufacture the drones here in the Bay Area. So specifically, we manufacture in our facility in Hayward, uh, California. So Asher, um, what are the advantages and challenges of doing this? 
So just like the, the like design part is really linked between the software, the sensing, and the, my, the mechanical team, we, we discovered pretty early on it was going to be the same for manufacturing. That, you know, for we have this special navigation camera designed to work really well on our drone. We're going to want to own that every step of the way. So how do we, like, we can get now the engineers on site when we're receiving cameras, inspecting them. What does the fixturing look like when you assemble it into a product? And what does the testing look like afterwards? And then how do we package it up and put it put it into the product? And we we had all these really interesting learnings early on where we discovered, oh, we you know we really shouldn't be doing it that way because that's not protecting the sensor of the camera, or you or you have an image, or you have the uh, camera design engineer sitting there on the line, sit, like helping design exactly how we'll test it, and make sure that we not only bought a good module, but we put this good camera module into the drone in the right way. And it's going to work the way we expect. And that applies on the camera levels. It also just applies on the mechanical design level, most of what we, we, we work on. So I get to own, not well, get to be involved in both designing product, the fixtures that are used to assemble it, and then working with the exact operators who are on the line, who are on the line putting it together, you know, soldering the wires down. Um, and with that control all the way across the across the process, we can make sure we are not only designing, but manufacturing and taping up and shipping, you know, the best product possible. It's going to meet the needs, like the high, the high quality needs that our industry customers require. Uh, and then, uh, Asher, you know, you mentioned uh, earlier about reliability needed for a drone of this caliber. Can you uh, share a little bit about the testing that went through to just make sure that it was ready for prime time and getting into the hands of customers? Uh, yeah, sure. Like, um, we try to put the drone through everything you can imagine that the, the corner case customer is going to do. So like you're going, it's late night, you're working and you open the fridge and there's like a drone in there getting cold before a test because all the other ovens are, ovens are being used. Just across the board, we just try to do everything to push the drone to its limits. We make it hot, we make it cold, we put it in high humidity, low humidity. It's been off, it's been in the freezer. You take it out, you try to fly it right away, hot sun, up in the mountains. You know, we do thousands of hours of these testings. Um, and there's some cool videos that our reliability team likes to make with everything cycling and moving in a room. Kind of looks like a lot attack of the robots, but just in a room and cycling and trying to find everything that fails. And that's what we do. If something fails, we're like, all right, this one interface, this one bracket isn't quite right. We can change this on the next revision. That's how hard work, hardware development works. You push, you push the product to its limits. You find the failures, you fix the failures, and you you test again. Excellent. Um, well, uh, let's move on to some of the questions we we've had uh, submitted so far. So, the first one is, uh, you know, a nice little warm up question here is, what was the most fun testing scenarios for the X10 that you've done? Uh. For me, I was like pretty involved in a lot of the flight testing, like with the autonomy bring up and the controls. So I think we had a, you know, at the end of the day, we, you know, if we say we're going to, for example, qualify the, the, the product to fly at like 15,000 feet density altitude, we will actually go to 15,000 feet density altitude and fly a drone. And for me, that personally, that was like super fun. Um, I'm a huge mountaineer. Uh, that's a huge hobby of mine. So it was an interesting opportunity to, you know, combine something I like doing in my free time, like hiking and backpacking in the mountains with, you know, actual robotics and uh, engineering work. I wasn't sure. Asher, Russell, anything from your perspective that you thought was uh, kind of an interesting testing scenario? Yeah, I mean, so one kind of common use case where, where cameras can can struggle um, is in, in, in snow, right? Like it, the a white balance algorithm is trying to understand what the gray is in the scene. That's how it makes its decisions. Um, and so a, a really typical challenging scene for that is, is a snow scene where everything's white and then the algorithm's kind of trying to look for some blue and some green. So um, we recently in, I don't know where everyone's located, but here in, in California, we got a huge amount of snow in the, in the Sierras. Um, and I took that as a fantastic opportunity to go up to Tahoe um, and try out the the drone in, in those conditions and also, you know, spend a little a little weekend time getting some some skiing. And so I kind of paired that with like a, a really fun adventure, go get, a, you know, some powder runs in and then also uh, make sure that our camera was robust in those challenging conditions. So, uh, yeah, that's just one example. Well, perfect. Um, and the next one was, uh, can you share a little bit about how 
user feedback was included in the development of the X10. So were there any kind of community insights that shaped the project's direction or functionality or features? Yeah, I guess one thing for, and it kind of goes to some of the questions that are coming in on the Q&A, like we, we do at every stage, you know, reach out with, to customers, like get flight test feedback. Um, you know, so we bring features that people test in real life. I think one of the interesting things of testing in real life was finding out how popular like LTE um, as a feature would be. I think going into this program, a lot of us were maybe kind of skeptical of it, but, you know, working with various um, customers, like seeing their use cases and also hearing their pain points of, you know, for our first couple prototypes, like what are the issues that you're seeing? A lot of it was like latency, connectivity, reliability related. Um, and getting that feedback was super useful, but also I guess for us, like super informative because we weren't necessarily expecting that to be uh, as key of a feature as it would have been at the beginning of the program. And Russian and Asher, anything from your side that you saw any sort of user or beta feedback that you thought was actually really helpful in terms of development? Sure. It's a, uh... It's just, uh, the first thing that came to mind is our dual charger on the new product. We wanted to ask customers, I, I mentioned this when I talked about that customer visit, like how how often do you need to charge the batteries and then how many do you need? Um, and that comes into uptime. How long do customers want to be able to operate one drone continuously? And what, what does that infrastructure look like? Do you need like, what, 16 batteries to operate during the day or like a few batteries and chargers that can charge them really quickly? And what does your power supply look like? Um, so specifically, I visited a local customer and saw what that setup looked like in that truck to see like, okay, this is, you know, we want to have a high power adapter. So if you look at our dual charger right now, there are two plugs in the back of it. One of them can plug in a normal 100 watt USB-C cable, but we also know some users want to be able to charge a battery in under an hour, um, or actually I think it might be close to 45 minutes. We also have a 230 watt barrel jack that you can plug in for fast charging. And that was a specific capability we added in because we knew customers didn't want to carry a ton of batteries. They had the capacity to charge them. They just needed it to be done quickly. So that to set to find this new, this new connector and also the size, because we want to add a dump a little bit of heat to pull, pull that much power through it. Perfect. Well, um, we got a couple of other questions inside here. And um, Harrison, this one's for you is, do you have an API to allow end users to build use case specific add-ons on top of the navigation stack? Yeah, that's a good question. We get that a lot. There's obviously a lot of interest um, to, to do that. Uh, the answer is, so right now, the answer is no, we don't. Um, and I can actually provide a lot of context as for why. I think internally, as we've been developing software for the drone, there's kind of two aspects to this. One is that, you know, our autonomy stack really is this like tightly integrated thing. And a lot of the times we're, you know, pretty close to running to like the hardware limits of the system. So there isn't like, at, at least for S2 and X2, there weren't, uh, there wasn't as much space to run extra compute with, with the Orin, obviously that opens up a new world of possibilities, but that's just kind of explaining why we haven't done it before. The second is that we've found it's kind of hard to make a clean API. Uh, I think, you know, when you're thinking about a problem, it seems like pretty straightforward, like, oh, I'm going to have an API, like maybe I can just like define these points to go to. But then I think our experience actually like implementing stuff like 3D scan and implementing stuff like house scan, which is a partnership we have with Eagle View, is that a lot of the times halfway through the process, um, you know, maybe one of the APIs isn't as clean as you thought. Maybe you need capability that you probably don't want to expose um, because it kind of goes into a lot of internal machinery and is like pretty delicate. Um, which you need to get your, your task done. So um, from that aspect, I, I don't know that, you know, if we released an API, if it would actually do what a lot of people want. I um, mean, I think the third aspect is like, just from a pure like engineering perspective, um, it, it takes a lot of effort to kind of like sandbox the code. At the end of the day, we want the system to be really reliable. So you know, with whatever we give to the user, we want it to be robust and fly. And then I guess, you know, if you're allowing folks to run kind of arbitrary code on your platform, it's kind of hard to, to protect against that. Um, but with all that being said, yeah, I think the 
that's one thing that we're looking at kind of at a very high level with X10 because of the extra compute, seeing how we can maybe make compute sandboxes and maybe bring that out. Um, one thing we are definitely making more concrete steps to, though, is like allowing for API access to the data capture. Um, I think we found out that at the end of the day, most folks that want API access don't really care about flying. Um, they care about the data, right? So we are making a lot of um, efforts to, like with the, with the cloud product we offer to kind of allow API access at the imagery and at the data level, but not necessarily at the like flying robot level. It looks like there's another question here, uh, Harrison. It's, um, is there an open interface for the ORIN for customers to use their own AI on the camera and drone data received on board? Yeah, at the moment, uh, no, like uh, we don't allow that. But again, that's like something we're potentially exploring for the future. Um, and then another question came and says, how secure are the C2 and sensor links versus JDI? Are cellular communications providing reliable and good choice for UAS, especially in DD loss expands? I'm not sure if we have the expertise on the call here today to address that. So yeah, I guess I can I can comment to it to a certain extent. I think for the latter question, like is is um, cellular providing useful for BBLS? I think one thing to really remember is that you know a lot of the times a C2 link for like a, a drone is really important because you need control and um, I guess not quite C2, but it's like RF related. You know, you need GPS signal to robustly fly. I think a huge advantage of the SkyD system is like. You know, we are an autonomous system from the ground up, so we are a lot more robust to the, you know, to C2 dropouts, to like high latency in our C2 link. Um, so for us, with our platform, we found that, yeah, cellular is proving to be a great choice. It's super useful to get that connectivity option. And I think it's something that would almost be impossible to pull off, actually, on other vehicle platforms because of all the, like, innate nature challenges with cellular. Um do kind of make it a crummy C2 link if you don't have an autonomous platform, but because we have that autonomy, it really enables this like secondary uh, connectivity. Um, in terms of security, yeah, like most of our wireless is like pretty, you know, we follow industry best practices. I can't comment specifically about the wireless security because that's not really my area of expertise, but like in terms of overall kind of software security, like X10, we really did take it super seriously. Like through our development process, we have a lot of pen testing and, you know, it's our first product that's leveraging a lot of like hardware security features that are baked into the, the chips we have to kind of ensure um, integrity of our software load, like from factory to customer. Excellent. And, and again, I'm not sure if someone on this, uh panel would be able to answer this. this is more about um, the communications. And so um, Stephen actually asked, can you talk more about the X10 as it relates to comms, e.g. preventing jamming and the like? Um, and that may be a question we just may take off offline. Um, but uh, anybody on the panel have any perspective on that? Yeah, I mean, I guess kind of related to the previous point, that's actually kind of a huge, that's kind of a huge area we think about in terms of autonomy, is how can you operate in an RF denied environment? Because it doesn't just happen for you know defense customers like there's plenty of inspection use cases where folks want to go in a factory or go in a power station where um you have EMI and other other interference that degrades you know GPS degrades comms um yeah i think overall our our kind of strategy for X10 is really again relying on the visual navigation system i think that unlike basically for other drones right if you jam the entire rf spectrum you're, you're a little hosed because you're relying on GPS and you're relying on a command link to stay in the air. But, you know, for us, um, you know, in testing, we've had cases where the entire radio subsystem fails, but the, the vehicle kind of flies itself and returns to home because, you know, at the end of the day, we do have that visual navigation system um, and we do have that, like, capability to not have to rely on RF to stay in the air. Um, obviously, we put a lot of effort into making those RF links as great as possible, but I think we do kind of, because of the autonomy system, have a lot more like intrinsic robustness to those scenarios. So even if you do lose a C2 link, like, hey, you can still do your data capture and still get back. And you know, another thing to bring in mind too is that there's actually two different variations of the X10. There's the X10, which is the one that was uh, announced over in September. There's the other one that actually just recently 
uh, came out and that's the X10D and the D stands for defense. So defense applications and that's the offline version, more secure version uses micro hard um, in the controller the, as well as inside the drone itself. And so one of the things we were introducing with that is actually dynamic channel switching. And so therefore if you are getting jammed on one particular channel, it will automatically progress to the next channel to make sure you actually get that um, that level of uh, connection that is appropriate for what you're actually needing at the time. So we are looking at even enhancing this even further in the future. But again, the two different versions, the X10, which is more the offline or the online version, the X10D is the offline for defense applications. Um, and then another question we had here is um, it's related to transmission towers. And so I'm going to create a 3D model of a transmission tower choosing parameters such as the floor and ceiling. Will the drone recognize and avoid the cables of the transmission line? If not, is there a way to do, do it? Um, I can actually talk to this one uh, really quick, and I don't know if anybody else has anything on here. So um, uh, we actually uh, shared something earlier uh, last year about something called uh, semantic understanding or semantic uh, uh, understand the environment. So I think that when you look at things such as transmission towers and the cables that come from that, that's actually really important because the drone needs to understand what is actually there. It sees the tower, but also has to understand that there's actually cables coming from it. And to avoid those, because again, part of obstacle avoidance is not hitting those high power uh, cables. And so that's actually one that our team is actually working on. And actually, I, gave, we gave, I believe we gave a early stage preview um, last year on this one. So again, we're actively working on that one. But again, understanding what's not only in, in front of, also understanding what is around it um, is actually going to be very important. So you should see some more about that later in this year. But again, an area we're actively, actively working on right now. Um, I don't know if anybody from the panel had anything else to add to that one. But. Um, yeah, I guess like when I think about that question, I kind of in my head split it in two ways, right? Like the first core question is, hey, if I fly around a bunch of it around a bunch of challenging structures and about, about a bunch of challenging environments, will I hit obstacles? And the answer is uh, no, right? Like the core of the navigation engine is is even, you know, if you're manually flying the vehicle around, you'll have that autonomy, you'll have that obstacle avoidance and a huge host of our customers um, are already doing that, you know, inspecting very similar assets, if not transmission towers. And, you know, the autonomy and obstacle points is a huge reason why they trust X10 to do that kind of inspection. Um, yeah. And like you said, the second half of that is like, hey, can I tell it, scan a transmission tower and have, you know, Skydio automatically figure out um, how to do that. And yeah, like you said, with semantic AI, that's kind of what we're progressing towards. And one of the things that we're hoping to show in the future with especially with the compute capability that's now available on X10 because of the Orin system, um, we can kind of build those higher level systems. On top. Um, and another question um, was uh, regards to uh, crosshair coordinates. Um, so I had the opportunity to see a demo of the X10, but I didn't see crosshair in manual mode. Is that something we'll be added in a future software update or is that already in the drone operation? I just didn't see. Um, and again, not sure if this is the right audience for that one on the panel, but uh, if not, what we can do is that uh, uh, we'll actually follow up with you on this one. So anything we are not able to actually answer today, we'll make sure we follow up with. But I guess that opens up for any other questions that there might be out there. And if there are, feel free to submit those in the Q&A. Um, it looks like we have one other question inside here, and that is, you're competing against a much larger company it's, and organizations inside the drone space. How do you make this product with such a small team? I've, I've got a comment on that. Just it's be, by being like really focused in terms of what capabilities are going to add value to the customer, to get the drone launched sooner, make the manufacturing you know spin up faster. And by focusing just on those, you can you can do quite well with just a small focus team. Just like with a smaller team, there's less communication overhead. So what we will do is empower empower individuals um, to to know when they can. You know, get totally lost in a program that we've given them ownership of and, and, and when you need to look out for more help. Um, so yeah, it comes down to empowering individual individual uh, engineers. Do you Perfect. Do you, Russell? Um, yeah, I mean, it's. I, I think it's, I was going to, you know, go a similar path. I think, I think one thing that's unique about Skydio, like if, you know, I've, I've seen people come here and interview and, and, and you know, go through the process and, and something that's really obvious to most people is that we're everyone is like really excited about the product and really excited about what you're working on. I think if you have like 
you know, 10 people trying to do something and there, no one's really into it. It takes a long time and you can get it done. But here you can have like one really fired up engineer working on something and they're going to like really put a bunch of effort into it and, you know, maybe work a little bit longer hours and like they're passionate about it. It's like, it's almost like, you know, a hobby is at the same time. Like you're just so into what you're working on. I think that's what I noticed about it is we're, you know, we're really excited about each component that we're building. You know, if you're, if you're um, Asher and you're building the hardware, like Asher loves it. Like he, you know, eats and breathes hardware design. Um, and me, I love cameras. And so like, I think we're all passionate about what we do. So we have this small team that's all fired up and we're able to like, you know, do what 10 people could do with just one person, just because, you know, we have that kind of intensity and, and um, excitement. All right. Well, excellent. Um, I'm fired up just by hearing about that guys. Um, and so last question we have here is kind of more of a general one. It's that what were the challenges with consumer drones and why did you choose to discontinue? Oh, I, I can I can start. There's a there's a difference between selling like a few things to like you know ten thousand things to ten thousand customers or small fewer things to to fewer customers or the, or the same number of drones maybe to fewer customers. Um, and the, the value is that is there is that you can really focus on the capabilities you're trying to hit. Um, consumer drone space is super fun, super exciting, and I my understanding is eventually we'll want to get back there. At least that's the that, that that's the line I hear. Um, and that we're working towards. Um, but by by switching to the enterprise space, there's there's so much value we can add by focusing here on just changing the way the world works. Um, and that's something we, we we wanted to do. We we're excited to do. We heard from customers that you know if you build it, we we will use it. So that's those are my thoughts. Yeah, it's actually kind of interesting. I, I actually don't know that we'd have as capable of an autonomy platform if we hadn't focused on consumer first, like to a certain extent. Um, you know, if you were to, you know, if, if your goal was to provide ISR to asset inspection, and then somebody said, and the way I'm going to do that is by making a robot that can like totally fly itself and first, and then like figure out how to solve your problem. Um, people would kind of call you crazy, but that's kind of like the approach that we had to take from going to consumer first. Um, so in in some ways, it's like more challenging on the navigation engine. Um, and that, so I think it was actually like from, from the autonomy perspective, we were very excited to kind of pursue that path. But I think to why we ultimately like shifted away, like, you know, I think at the end of the day, we were super excited to see that hey by making this like self-flying platform it actually makes it perfectly suited for all these other use cases um and we kind of wanted to focus our energies there because i think also ultimately we wanted to focus on what had the most impact and like yeah there's a bunch of super important use cases out there that uh can use this technology and we ultimately wanted to focus our efforts that way 